wanted to ask you about what I think until recently might be the most secretive mural in Australia. Is it in Canberra? Yeah, it's in Canberra. I, I don't even know if you can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. But yeah, what can you tell us about this this secret wall? I, I did a mural for a government agency. Um, I don't know how much I can say. And then you've also got your unicorn in the stable and your unicorn is shiny and beautiful and stupid and majestic and it is the creature that like fills you with inspiration and it's the creature that reminds you that you love what you do and it fills you with passion. Initially, I, my intent wasn't for people to collect them. It was just a permanent work to, to be put up there using different, um, I guess, different surfaces. And then once I realised that people were collecting them, I'm like, well, this is another way to interact with, uh, with an audience. And I started to design them more for go and collect them, go find them and see if you can get it. It became kind of a challenge for me to put them in a place where people were forced to explore something like a, a space that was new. Amazing guests this week. We've got Britt and James, aka Hole in the Flats. Hello, hello. Welcome, guys. <laughs> How you been? Great. Oh. Happy to be here. Yeah, excited. Awesome. No, very excited to have you guys in. Uh, it's been uh, a, a couple of guests that I've wanted to have in here for a long time, so it's going to be cool to uh, to chat and uh, and uh, catch up on what you guys have been working on. But uh, firstly, it seems like you've been out today painting just before you came here. Yeah, yeah. First time in, in a while, but I figured if I'm going to come here and talk about art, I may as well make sure that I'm still practising. <laughs> Dust off the cobwebs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or at least something that's for me and not commissioned or, or a big public mural, just something, yeah. And people that follow your uh, Instagram account will probably be familiar with the with the tanks that are often, uh, 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 your works are often adorning. Yeah. Is that, what What are those tanks? I've always wondered. They're just two water tanks on my property. So when I was, we moved out to this place, 2018. And before that, I was living right in the heart of Canberra. Or, and I was able to go to all the legal spots. But now that I'm just a little bit further out, there's no legal spots there. So with two big water tanks, they're just for me. Was that a prerequisite to buying that place? Or moving into that place? Not a prerequisite, but when we're looking at it, we're like, oh, that's not a bad <laughs> idea. I can I can make this work. Either that or just build my own wall. But these came pre-built, didn't need to worry. Have you done the um, glad wrap between two trees any time in the last decade? <laughs> I've been tempted to do it on the property just as a break up from the, uh, from the tanks, but I haven't yet. Just finding finding that time at the moment is... It's what it is. Yeah. It's difficult. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite the luxury you got there. I guess you, you just how often are you repainting and then just chuck up another layer and go again? I've so I moved. I moved in there on 2017, 18. Then I moved away um, over to the states for three years. And when I came back, I just cleaned it all, um, painted it all over, and I've been slowly going back and re-adding it. So it's only had one recoat, but the. <laughs> The goal is to just continually go over it again. Go again around again. in circles. Yeah. yeah. I've got a, a friend coming, uh, Jamie, who's um, used to paint under the name The Dirt. Now he's a very big, beautiful artist and he's meant to be coming by on Friday and hoping for another another paint there. And this is the one you had tonight. Oh, glorious. I mean, Look at that not, vista. It's not too bad. <laughs> Unreal. It's almost you need to do an uh, exhibition out there, <laughs> get people around. I mean, my, my father-in-law is like, you need to start a little gallery out there, James. I'm like, Who's going to come and see <laughs> see this stuff? Who's going to come and look at a water tank? <laughs> Me. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll, I'll be come. there. We'll get massive flats out there yeah. filming the docker. <laughs> That's you know? it. And Britt, what have you been working on? I've been working on lots of 
nothing. We, it's funny. We, <laughs> we've been talking a lot lately about uh, like your commissioned work that you do for work and the work that you do for love. And I've been doing a lot of uh, like work work lately. Um, and so the stuff that I'm doing for love is something that I really want to focus on a little bit more at the moment. But uh, trying to get into collage a lot lately, which is cool. Um, but yeah, my cup is empty. I got to get out there and do some stuff. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> so do we know what that could be yet or it's still, uh, w- what about the collages? What are they going to look like? Oh, the, the collages I've been doing are kind of, uh, a mix of things that I don't want to ever see the light of day. So it's <laughs> having that freedom to just do whatever I want. It doesn't matter how good they look. It doesn't matter how bad they are. Um, but I think after working on surface festival and after working on, um, a bit of the uncharted territory festival that we've just had, I'm really keen to do some more producing side of things and getting the like puppet strings out and maybe organizing some more things. That's where I think I'm getting the most energy out of. Yeah. Awesome. So more events. Yeah. Uh, so p- people at home might not know, but Brit was behind the surface festival that the walls were taken over Braddon for, for that period and all still stand now much, uh, to the delight of everyone, I assume, and it looks just so much better now. How was it putting together that festival? It was a, it was a really cool collaboration. Because it was the first uh, f- sort of for Canberra that we've done anything like that. Yeah, so it was um, brought on by the ACT government. So Lisa Petherham, who has been mentioned lots on this podcast before, uh, was a real champion for that. And then we also had uh, Fibs, the, art, the street artist Fibs. He was the main producer for it. And then I was brought on as a local producer Um because those guys were coming in from interstate, they really wanted a local to work on the festival too. And it was an awesome experience. Like I think for that one, because it, we, the festival was really like what it was on the box. It was a, quite an obvious like street art festival. And so the the putting it on and the branding and the marketing of it was pretty straightforward. And then like juxtaposing that to the innovation festival that has just finished was, it was much more of like, a theory first and then it had to then become a festival, if that makes sense. They were kind of polar opposites, which was two very different experiences. Um, but Surface was great. Like met awesome people. The walls, you know, 99% of the walls are still up and you can see them every day. So that just makes me super happy walking around Canberra. Absolutely. No, it was much needed. And Are we going to see it back? Do you know? Yeah. It depends on funding. Hey, like that, the amount of funding that they had for it was a real one-off. And then like with the budget coming up soon as well, I I hope so. That'd be sick. Yeah. So there's, yeah, no talk. I guess you'd have to go somewhere else because Braddon's pretty, there's a few walls still in Braddon. And I think when it first got announced, some of the feedback around it was like, oh, it should be further than just in the city. And Mm -hmm. like when we, when we were planning it, we were, we, there were satellite events and there was stuff that was outside of the city center, but really the majority of it was. And so I think in whatever future it has, um, seeing it go into the town centres would be the really exciting opportunity there. I want to see it out in Fishwick. That's what I mean, I, so many blank walls. Exactly. That I mean, cool. and that's that that kind of environment that would just be perfect for it. Yeah. And especially for a space that is, I guess, you're seeing more things pop up out there. This would definitely be a place, uh, like a way to drive more people out to see what Fishwick has. Yeah, and really what like drives it as well is the building owners being on board. Um, and that was a challenge with Braddon because, you know, the aesthetics of Braddon are so important to the building owners and so many of the buildings were brand new. Um, and so out in Fishwick, you might have some building owners that might be more up for some random stuff on their buildings or they might be getting hit with graffiti and be happy to have murals to take their place. Mm. And how did you find working with that? side of the government side and the artists it was interesting and challenging and I learned a lot but I found my position in it was almost like a mediator between the two at times um and it's also hard because I'm just I'm a big people pleaser and so I'd talk to one and be like yep no problem happy to do that and then I'd go to the other and be like ah yep no problem okay happy to do that so running around um and also I think having the government as a partner with it was like invaluable because at the very end of the day, they 
got walls. They shut down uh, streets. They got all the traffic management in place. Like, have, So having them, because it was done by the Transport Canberra and City Services as well. So that department of government aren't events managers. So it was a, an interesting experience for them as a team for one, but they were just so well equipped to the logistic side of the festival, which I think is quite rare. And that was really cool. And then having someone like Fibs and Jacinta, who's from the wall station as well, who had just such like wonderful networks and really cool vision come in to curate it. It was, it was a really, really cool collaboration, but, but it was a challenging collaboration. But yeah, they're the blank walls. Not I, so I don't know how anymore. you did it. I felt like I was being a pain in the ass on the day and then having 30 different artists all say, oh, Britt, can you do this? Britt, what am I meant to be doing here? Just that, like the juggling act was... Yeah, we haven't seen anything of that sort of scale in Canberra in that world. No. So, or other cities don't even do it at this sort of scale all at once, do they really? Yeah, I think Fibs does have experience running a few festivals around... Australia like he's got a couple that he's behind which is really cool and so there are some like key artists that are really really talented in that huge large scale stuff and I think that was probably the most daunting stuff is you had Drez and um, Crimson and Scott Scott doing these projects that took them 10 days to paint like can you yeah. imagine being on no. a cherry picker for 10 days? <laughs> I, I just get lost in that little space and you look back and you're like, okay, my nose is is this big and the face is three metres tall. So it's that being able to work with the scale is... Yeah, it's a different part of your brain yeah, yeah. completely. Yeah. Would you take on a a, uh, a wall like that? There's. I mean, in a heartbeat, yeah. I'd, I'd fuck it up immediately, but <laughs> but I'd do it. It'd be lots of lots of trial and error, lots of speaking to other artists that I know that have painted at that scale and going, okay, how, how do I actually do this? I've committed to it. Now I've got to figure out how it actually works. Yeah, I love it when you see people on the cherry picker and they've got their phone as their reference and then they're painting on this like <laughs> five-storey building. Yeah. Oh, we got to make that happen. we got to see that. A big hole on the fucking wall. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't even know how to begin it. Like maybe a projection up there. I think that I don't, I don't imagine they did that. No. No. But some artists I've seen in the past, like projecting up there, yeah. but it, it just, I don't know, that tracing, the, the, the sketching, the using the reference. And speaking of scale, you did, um, I think you took part in that, um, the like micro street yeah. art or something. It was, it was yeah, the a, little festival. The little festival, yeah. yeah. So that's the kind of the opposite. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's definitely more what I'm used to and comfortable with. It was actually run by Jacinta who was one of the minds behind uh, Surface and just wanted to take the complete opposite direction. I think they had the Big Picture Festival at the same time in Newcastle, which is another mural festival. They're like, well, let's just take these three little, like three blocks and put small works up. So these are like installations. I think there was like another 20, 30 artists and we just walked around that morning. They're like, you can put anything up here, here, here. Don't touch this space. You can work over there. It was weird. I love I, it. I loved it. Jacinta introduced me to this concept of being a producer. So <laughs> one of the cool things is she kind of scours for all the government grants across Australia and depending on what they're for, she just creates festivals out of her brain uh, and applies for these grants in part of that pays herself at producer fees all in the budgets and everything like that and sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't and the ones that happen it's like cool that's my year planned through these three festivals I got like funded for and that's what she does as a producer yeah it's just like that's a, so cool you've just yeah. created this job that I just didn't know existed yeah and that was the spark for you to be like I want to do more of that now yeah I think yeah. it was like oh wow that's actually possible and it is a real thing the challenge is writing grant applications. Yeah. <laughs> There's oh, no fun in that. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got some cool ideas. Surely that's what ChatGPT is for, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, actually. We should try and harness that. I, I have no doubt lots of people are out there are already doing it. Like I've got a, I need an application for this particular thing. ChatGPT will sit, create it all, 
there might be might be some tidying up, but I've no doubt that there are a bunch of people already out there. Hundred percent, yeah. 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 It's just a, it's just another tool. It's just another tool. Yeah, yeah. Problem is, it uses the word like unleash your potential. It uses just like the word. That's what they yeah, right. love. They love that yeah. shit. <laughs> and um, another sort of aspect to that, the little festival is you you often just put your works out and leave them there and then say here they are first one in come and grab it yeah how's that process for you and uh, as a way of uh, putting your work out there i mean it was born out of before i moved to canberra i've been here i think we were talking maybe 12 13 years um i was in sydney and i was doing paste ups like once a week running out there with friends and we were just everywhere and moving to canberra the like the spaces for pasting just aren't there. There aren't the derelict buildings. There aren't the um, cladding that you can easily paste on. So eventually I was like, I, I need to go out there and do something again. So I realized that I can just get pieces of cardboard. I can get core flute and just cable tie them or blue tack them uh, around. This was one for um, for a little festival. Oh, was it? Yeah. Um, but initially I my intent wasn't for people to collect them. It was just a permanent work to, to be put up there using different, um, I guess, different surfaces. And then once I realized that people were collecting them, I'm like, well, this is another way to interact with, uh, with an audience. And I started to design them more for go and collect them, go find them and see if you can get it. It became kind of a challenge for me to put them in a place where people were forced to explore something like a, a space that was new and do you feel like you're doing something naughty sometimes yeah. i mean i've been pulled up a couple of times it's like um, does it feel like because like does it feel like graffiti in any way yes and no like when i'm just blue tacking it somewhere it feels less naughty than like cable tying it cable tying somehow being more permanent than yeah. blue tack but both of them you can pull them off easy but i still get that that kind of flutter that okay cool let's let's go and you look around all right am i littering um, yeah that's it that's it i mean it's aggravated littering at, 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 at worst hopefully it's recycling though because yeah, someone's gonna come and pick it up and that's yeah. exactly and i never buy the cardboard i never buy the core flute it is just boxes that i've gotten i'm like cool I've got this stack of cardboard. My wife's like, you need to get rid of this cardboard. I'm, I'm sick of seeing it around the place. It's just lining up everyone. I'm like, well, this is a really nice piece and it's thick and I, there's no like flexibility to it. So that'll be a really nice piece that I can cable tie to a street pole. It's, there's cardboard everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the problem is then running about and finding that the, the time to do it when you're working a nine to five and you've got weekend commitments and – be like, no, cool, I'm going to – I've got a growing stack. I'm like, no, I need to find time to actually go out and install this. Yeah, I definitely find that like the collection of the possibility of art is like an exciting part of it. Like I don't know. I find that like w with doing the collages and stuff like that, it's like cutting it out and collecting it and like sorting it and stuff like that is almost – more of the art form than actually just creating anything with it. Yeah, it's the that potential, exactly what I mean. Yeah. It's the potential. All these different, like I've got old rusted saw blades. I'm like, this is going to be incredible. And again, they just, I'm like, oh, I found these like nice little bottle caps I can paint on these. I Maybe can... you're just a collector. That's it, I'm a hoarder. <laughs> I, think that might, I think that might actually be the first stuff I saw of you was the, um, the stuff on the cigarette packets. At um, Art Not Apart. Yeah, yeah. And did you have like a, a, a stall or something at the very first one or something? So I'd been, I mean, I was involved in every Art Not Apart. Um, I had stalls just selling whatever shit I had about. I did some live stuff for a couple of them where I just set up a um, an easel and some plywood and drew on that because that's where I kind of, all of this grew out of me doing live work. Um, like with Secret Wars and then I think I'm – Commitment Nuisance. Yeah, yeah, Commitment Nuisance and, and all those little events where art is kind of put to the forefront as a social 
like a social engagement. You go, you see art, you see art being created, but then you're with friends, you have drinks and there's – I think that changes the dynamic of the artwork. But, but yeah, with the, the cigarette packets, I was overseas at the time and I'm just finding these cigarette packs on the ground and it's like they're so bright and shiny and colourful. The cigarette, cigarette packs over here are – all that same uniform colour. So I was like, this is definitely meant to attract and meant to kind of, oh, look how pretty it is. And so I'll throw some birds on top of that. There's that safety in birds that we all know, but it's also the plumage of the birds as like that mating call element. And I desperately wanted to be to continue being part of Art Not Apart simply because I'd done it each year. And uh, I think it was Bird that was um, coordinating the artists for that one. He's like, what can you send? And I was like, here are some like high res scans of this thing, <laughs> and he blew them up big and bolted them to the walls. It was fun. Yeah, I feel like that's something we're kind of missing in Canberra at the moment. Is like when we first met and we first started doing art, and I don't know, parallel to each other. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was all like you know there were these live events of of painting, commit your nuisance. We had art not apart. We had raw artists. <laughs> oh, um, but I just, I feel like there's a bit of a gap in camera at the moment for like the initial artists that are kind of just trying to get out there and do stuff. And I, I was thinking about it today. I was kind of thinking like, I feel like we just don't have the like inspired uh, artistic venue owners at the moment. Because yeah. I think about like Honky Tonks and Academy. and like, I mean, Honky Tonks is my first solo exhibition. Yeah. And... Yeah, it was, it was a space where it was like in the heart of the city and you could go and there isn't that. I, I was wondering why I felt kind of disconnected from the, from the art scene for a while because I don't see new people coming up and I expect that there is new artists emerging. Like I can see a couple but because I'm not seeing a whole bunch like, like there was when, when we get started, I'm like am I just – out of touch. Are we old? Oh God, <laughs> it's happened. It's happened. I knew that it would happen, but but you also need champions in place. Like Canberra is a you know small small city, so the the champions in those spaces are crucial. And I'm like so thankful for all the cha- like Sancho, Dave Caffrey. Yeah, you know, yeah, these it's people awesome. that are yeah driving it forward. Yeah, I mean it was Sancho that when I first moved here. It was her paste ups that I did see, like on the un, un, in underpasses. I'm like, who is this? I think it was a walrus in like a wrestling uniform with a slurpee, and I hunted her down, found like this this person creating art. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna just attach myself to you, <laughs> and and then from there started to meet all the all the other artists. That was, I mean, I think the first work of yours that I remember was, what was it in? One of the nightclubs, and you did a mandala on the roof. Oh my god! Yeah, Mister Wolf. Was, yeah, Mister Wolf. It now one, two, two. Yeah, I think you did one with like dicks. Yeah, um, yeah, incredible. <laughs> incredible. Very, very yeah. classy things. Yeah. I mean, all class. Really respecting the art form of the mandala. <laughs> but yeah, that I mean, those spaces of discovery. I don't know where they are anymore. Yeah, and I, I think it might be part of the like aesthetic as well like all oh, the venues want beautiful fancy instagrammable things and they don't trust you know young 20 year old kids to just come in and paint on their million dollar venues yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe well you've still got um from one venue that definitely has your stuff all over it is grease monkey oh yeah tell yeah. us tell us about uh how that project came together with them and uh did you ever think it'd be sort of going this far from north to south of Canberra venues with uh, with your stuff all over the the burger wrappers? Yeah, definitely didn't see that happening. It was a weird, weird kind of string of events. Actually, through Sancho, Sancho um, got tapped on the shoulder by um, someone in a design agency, and they wanted some murals uh, in their office space didn't want murals because it was a nice fancy office space. And so I had all this like huge rolls of contacts. So I did a bunch of work there. Um, one of the designers um, was the daughter of um, Sock who owns um, Grease Monkey and a bunch of other places. And 
she then reached out to me and said, oh, would you be interested in doing some work for my cafe, which was um, uh, Penny University. And so I did some work for there and then it was into Grease Monkey and Sock was like, would you like, would, would you be interested in doing some designs for us? And it's just this kind of ongoing relationship there um, where they're like, oh, can you add this and can you do this? And then they turned uh, the little space next to them um, in Braddon was – they turned it into Catch, which was like a seafood place. And so I did like that surfing, um, yeah, uh, the, the, like the surfing monkey there and I'm just slowly building it up. They're iconic. They really are. They have become <laughs> totally iconic, yeah. I mean, it just, I, I wouldn't have expected it. I didn't, I mean, I still, it's still surreal going in and seeing my work there and in like other stores where, I mean, the the ones in Brad and I painted on the wall, but for the other ones they've had, sign writers come in and, and do them um, so there is that uniformity but it's still surreal. You get free burgers? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean when, when I'm in there with Sock he's like, yeah, whatever, whatever you want but I mean it's been that long. That It's just you can't imagine uh, Grease Monkey without those images now and it suited your style so perfectly. It, it matched up well. Yeah. Yeah, really cool. You do sarcasm well in the in the creatures' faces. <laughs> like, because I think about even the Penny University ones as well. Like, you know, the creatures in their suits and things like that. And then like, just deadpan. The deadpan eyes. <laughs> I had years ago, I found on the uh, the, the floor of my classroom a, uh, a kid's scrawled note that was how to be whole. And uh, step one, a line across the stop. Step two, two little, like, these these types of, of eyes there that it's that straight edge. <laughs> Step three, profit. Okay, so it's taking the piss. It wasn't yeah, me. No, no, one hundred percent taking the piss. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I've still got that somewhere. Yeah, that 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 was. I mean, that's all I could draw for ages. Um, like when I was practicing and developing my style, it was very much the straight that I. That eye, I was like, no, I have to keep doing this. This is my, my, my hook, my unique thing about me. Then I was like, I, I don't need that. I just want to continue to draw. So then you started doing hands. I mean, that's that's simply because people are like hands are so difficult. And so they I, are so hard. But, but then I sat there at uni and like this is half my uni degree was me with a hand out on the desk, like half paying attention to to the lecturers going, okay, I'm going to draw this hand again and again and again until it's just fluid. Amazing. It's fun. I've been doing more recently where kind of looking at the AI generated hands with all the extra fingers and playing into that where it's me drawing these hands with like fucked up extra things coming out of them. It's, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but (laughs) I like that, that kind of turning it back around. Do you think that's influenced also by maybe all the horror novels you've been reading? (laughs) Maybe, maybe it's, I mean, I, Literature definitely inspires a lot of what I do, but I don't know where where half of it comes from. Mm. How about the the book uh, illustrations? I mean, that was so. There's a, an artist um, from Melbourne, uh, Alexis Winter, and she's uh, an illustrator and uh, teacher as well. And she decided that she wanted to make this. I think it was initially like a yearly series where she would move from one project to the next to the next and the first one that she did was what she called the mini monotone book club and once a month you were to share a favourite book that you'd done a mini monotone illustration of and after 12 months she was like, cool, that's it, that's that's done and I was like, no, no, I, I really like this. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to do it and so I've just kind of continued it. Every, every single book... Every time I finish a book, I, I do one of these illustrations and I don't start the next one until I've, I've finished it. I love it. I get so much of my reading inspiration from your Instagram. You've just started doing star ratings. Yeah. What changed there? I, I don't know. I felt like maybe I need to be a little bit more... <laughs> a, of proper, a reviewer. A, a proper review. <laughs> but, I mean, who wants to hear my opinion on, on these books? Me. Um, I'm here reading it. <laughs> they're... Do you get people saying like, oh, I read that because of you and that sort of thing? I mean, just, just yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> I, every now and then. But I think when you are talking before about those, the projects that you do for yourself, this is the one that I do for me. I mean, if it, it's just that 
that drive where I I want to create this. I've got them kind of up on my wall, um, but I don't know if it's the like teacher in you or if you have just extremely high standards. But the like the caliber of the books in that list are all like you know literary classics or like modern day classics and stuff like that. Like they're all good books. <laughs> like, or do you just curate them well? I don't know. Like, I don't like to not finish a book. I have a couple of times, yeah. and I'm like, I I don't have the time to waste on this. But I I really do try to finish it, finish everything. So you. It is more unfiltered than I would want it to be. Mm. But I'm also just – someone recommends a book and they're like, this is really good. I'll take that as a gospel. I'm like, cool, I want to read this. If they, if this person is saying read this, then I've, I've got to do it. So I think you recommended uh, – oh, it was the Australian one. Flames? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I read that. I enjoyed it. I, do, I don't read a lot. You only gave it three and a half stars, though. I remember that. I mean, I, st- I still enjoyed it. <laughs> my, my ratings is, I mean, any less than three, I don't I don't care about. Um, I know. I'm like, it's bad. I'm like also a completionist. But if things don't have like the high enough reviews, I'm like, no, no, not worth my time. Like Goodreads, anything less than a four? No. Rotten Tomatoes, anything less than 85? Not worth my time. And... Uh, Jennifer Coolidge uh, from White Lotus spoke at Vivid in Sydney earlier this year and someone asked her about like, you know, how do you, how do, you do what you do? Um, and she was saying that she makes an active effort to consume shit because it makes her feel better about herself and motivates herself. And it's like if you, you know, watch all the movies of the amazing actors, of course you're going to feel bad about yourself. So you go to like a student theatre and you watch a crappy Shakespeare play and then you can do anything. And I think maybe the shift f- for the next little while is just to consume, consume absolute shit. trash okay. and then get motivated to be like, oh, I can do better than that. All right. So I'd like to see a one-star review. So I'm, I'm going to get a, like an upturn in followers now. People are like, yeah, I want to follow shit. I'm going to follow whole. Read some like <laughs> fan yeah, fiction. Yeah, get deep into like, fan yeah, fiction. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like uh, those erotica novels and stuff. There's plenty yeah. on Amazon. <laughs> I do have a list, actually. <laughs> oh, you do Audible, though. That might be if you're on the bus. <laughs> Just sitting there blushing. Oh. I know. It'd make it, make it easier than sitting there reading it like, anyone looking over my shoulder? That's true. Does listening to a book count as reading it? I ask myself this every single time I finish an Audible book and put it in my Goodreads. Yeah, it does. You're still consuming it. You yeah. still aren't reading the story. Yeah. It's just, I think it changes the experience a bit. And I do find like a good narrator will make or break a book. I, oh, I've, I've yeah. stopped listening. Um, like I'll get 10 minutes in. I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. I know that the book is meant to be incredible, but I can't listen to this person read it to me. So I'll just never read it. Yeah, 100%. Or I'll actually go, go and find, it. find the, yeah. the physical copy. Yeah, I've never uh, been able to do the, the tablet reading or listening. I only... I only read a physical book. Yeah, okay. But I don't read that much. I just read a little bit. Isn't it weird yeah. how your brain is just like, like a physical book, just so much nicer. Yeah, yeah. Like you kind of feel like you haven't put in enough effort either when you just listen to a book as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I was having this discussion recently. It's like I, I don't, most of the books I, I read now are audio books simply because finding that the time to do it and the drive to work is an easy like I get twenty five half hour of a book on the mo- in the morning and, and then on the way back, but it I do feel a little dirty. <laughs> it's like I'm not turning a page. I can pause it and you're just productivity I, hacking everything in I your mean, life. That's it. I, while painting that one this afternoon, I was listening to another book. And it's <laughs> all those people that like listen to the books in fast forward. Can't do that. That I can't do. I can watch like a short YouTube video like that, but not. I couldn't read a book like that. When it, when it's too sped up and they're talking really fast, it you just you can't follow along. Well, I can't follow along. I'm with you there. Yeah. No, nah, I'm all about it. <laughs> you do it. Yeah. No way. How how fast do you go? One point five. One point five. Not not insane. Okay. And normally it's just with podcasts, and some of the times you forget that you're listening to it at that speed, and then like I'll get in the car and put it on like my partner's phone instead. And people's voices will just be like that. And be like, 
That's what they sound like. <laughs> so some people listening right now might be doing that exact thing to your voice at home. I mean, I don't blame them. You're welcome. <laughs> um, brand Rebellion. Yeah. What are you doing there? Tell us about that. Um, so Brand Rebellion is a really interesting company that I've never worked for anything like it before. So it puts the like branding side of a business and the workforce side of the business together. So at the moment we're kind of figuring out where we sit in the market in Canberra. Um, but there personally, I'm the, um, senior designer. So I'm doing the graphic design and I'm kind of been put forward as the, the creative in the room whenever we have to do like business strategies and stuff like that. So it sounds very businessy. <laughs> but you've kind of have juggled cause you did some time at innovation, Canberra innovation, you're working with businesses. How have you found that balance of, um, being an artist in the business sort of world. Yeah. I think it, I've kind of always had like the entrepreneurial aspect of art ingrained in me a little bit, um, which I think is a little bit detrimental and something that I'm trying to actually break out of a little bit uh, is most of my career has been in marketing or in design where it's tied to a brand or it's tied to a campaign or it's tied to money in some sort of way. And I guess everything is going to be tied to money in some sort of way at the end of it. Um, but I guess having it tied to a brand or having it, having your art work tied to consumerism is a weird thing to learn in that area first. I and don't know. yeah. And did you, I, I don't know if this is, a thing, but I th kind of thought about that artists and business are often used, businesses use an artist like to commission a work, but they're not really ever um, supporting artists in that way where it's like, we'll just see what happens um, and do what you want and then that'll help our business, but rather it's a commission-based system. Yeah, it's like transaction, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's this concept that, um, Monica Davies came up with. She runs a business up in Sydney, uh, called creative plus business, which helps creatives build business skills. Um, and it's this concept that every creative that wants to like build a professional life out of what they do, uh, in their minds has a stable and <laughs> the stable has, uh, the workhorse and the unicorn in it. And your workhorse is your commissioned work. It's the work that you do as a job. It's, you know, got a broad back and it's beautiful and it's stable uh, and it does its job well. But it's not necessarily like the work you really want to talk about at parties. Um, but you still, you still love the workhorse. And then you've also got your unicorn in the stable and your unicorn is shiny and beautiful and stupid and majestic and it is the creature that like fills you with inspiration and it's the creature that reminds you that you love what you do and it fills you with passion but the unicorn's job isn't to make money it can make money uh sometimes it takes a long time for a unicorn to make money and it can do it but if you expect it to make money it inherently changes the creature and so this concept is that you have to look after both of them if you want to be like a, a working creative. Uh, and if you feed the workhorse only, you'll be uninspired and maybe a bit depressed. And if you feed the unicorn only, you'll just be skint. <laughs> and so it's finding the balance between the two and helping them kind of fuel each other as well. And I just love it. Once I learn about it, I like most of the jobs I like attack now. I think about whether it's like, is this fueling the workhorse or is this fueling the unicorn? And sometimes it can be really hard to tell which one it is fueling. I mean, when you told me about it, I've immediately latched onto it. It's it's such an incredible analogy, and it it also helps you kind of prioritize as well. Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, I'm. I mean, you're saying when you're feeling a little bit depressed, it's, it's I need to go out and do something that's that's 
feeding that unicorn that's not worrying about the what money is going to come in from this. It's just making for the for the purpose of it. Like, yeah, mm. such a powerful powerful idea. And even like you asked before, what word I'm up to at the moment? It's like, man, I'm feeding my workhorse. Mm. <laughs> like my unicorn's shriveling in the corner, mm. but it's just just got to get back into it, look after it, figure shit out. <laughs> I think the thing is. It just desiccates and it just sitting there waiting until you feed it again and then it'll, it will jump back. Yeah. It's hard to kill it. Is there a third creature? No. I, <laughs> I reckon there is a way though to have it so that it's more into the balance of the unicorn as you progress and uh, through your career. Mm. So you, when you're starting out, you're obviously not going to be straight away just riding this unicorn around but as you go you can then start now it's more and more the unicorn than than the horse yeah i think the risk there is though as you rely more and more on the unicorn for to, to bring in that money does then that change into more of that workhorse do mm. you lose the passion the horn falls passion? off yeah passion. do you lose that drive to create or to to make something that is more unicorn based becomes that drudgery like having to make something you're like i don't i don't want to do this i i hate whatever project it is i get i get i get that with commissions mm. I'm like, i know i have to do this i know it's bringing that money in i know it's it's me making but every now and then it's like i i don't want to i want to that yeah I, I don't want to make this but i know that i have to yeah and like when you're talking before about like the artist when does that like business relationship actually benefit the artist and things like that it's kind of the split of that work too is that that workhorse work is the commission-based stuff where you don't really have much of a say and it's just paid and a transactional and that's it you're done you're gone but then the some of those jobs you're more likely to say yes to if you have more of that freedom that then can translate into the like the more freeing more you unicorn work and yeah. stuff like that yeah yeah, like it's legitimately what you want to do Yeah, is how – because obviously some people do it. You know, there's artists, full-time artists selling hundreds of millions of dollars artworks and they're just ones that they wanted to do completely. Yeah. So there is that possibility but still does then that still then become mundane for them? I, who knows? Um but there is a time when maybe there is a nice balance, definitely. Yeah, and I think something about the workhorse is it's not like – it's still creative work. So it's not the hospitality work and mm. stuff like that. It's still the creative work that you're doing in in this concept. Yeah, I love it's it. It's the hobby <laughs> – also the hobby thing. Like, is it best to keep it a hobby because doing it will ruin it? If yeah. you if you if you make it your job, then it'll ruin it maybe. Yeah, if you monetize everything you love. Yeah. The challenge of it. And I mean that is a serious concern. Like it's I mean, it's why I'm an English teacher, not an art teacher, because if I was teaching art every day, then I don't think I could bring myself to go home and continue to make art. Mm. I think I I don't understand how you can work in a creative field each like every day and then go home and still manage to be creative it's yeah it's and it's not in my head space i find that since being being way more of a designer in the workplace i don't i don't go home and do anything on my ipad anymore which is weird because i you know three years ago everything i made was on the ipad it was all digital stuff and now all i want to do is just not look at a screen for eight hours yeah <laughs> Yeah, okay. Hence the collection. Unless I'm playing, like, <laughs> unless I go back to, you know, Zelda for four yeah, hours, I yeah. whatever. <laughs> but I think the monetizing things as well has probably stifled me and is, is a challenge that I'm trying to figure out is because even the, like, hobby side of things that I have was creating things for market stalls, was creating, you know, T-shirt prints, apparel, that like pins and stuff like that, which started as like, I'm going to put my art on things and has quickly shifted into I'm going to make things to sell, which changes the way you design and it changes 
kind of what you're putting out. Like even to the is point- Is this marketable? Is this going to yeah. be- Yeah. Is this on the same level as this other thing which sells really well? And even to the point where I asked a shop recently, like, oh, what's my best seller? I'll just reprint that one. And then I was like, what am I doing? I should be making new stuff. Like, Yeah. But then people don't want that new stuff. They want the safe, the things that they're familiar with. Yeah. It takes them a while for them to get I don't know, acclimatized to anything new that's out there. Yeah, it's hard. Oh, yeah. Here's a little look. There you go. Hello. <laughs> So, yeah, um, I don't know what it is either. It's like this little like capitalist brain in my little capitalist brain. But like this idea that if I haven't done something in a long time, it like expires. Like everything has this 12 month expiry date on it that like I haven't made a pin in over 12 months now. So am I even a pin maker? Like what am I? Like and say like the murals as well. People be like, oh, you're a muralist. It's like, well, I haven't done a mural. I haven't been paid for a mural in over a year, so no, nah, not really. Like, yeah. I guess maybe. It's like... It's like a uniquely artist thing, but because no other, you know, job would do that. They would no. They would just... they If you, in a business environment, you're just like, oh, I haven't been a HR manager for three years, but... I'll talk it up in the interview and get the job. No worries. Like, yeah. Just pick it up where I left off. And But for some reason, yeah, maybe we do that because who knows why. I don't know. Crippling self-doubt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that sweet, sweet oh imposter. God, maybe we are artists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if there are any uh, businesses out there that yeah, would like their on. styles of, uh, <laughs> yeah, of anyone, us. Anyone, anyone. <laughs> yeah. Got blank walls, anyone yeah. got a cool venue manager, like we're ready. We'll put a list I mean, in the description of all of our, we our wants. Yeah. I mean, ultimately though, I'm I'm just happy to create. Like I, I will take commissions that aren't necessarily within my realm of like this is what I want to do simply because it means that I'm out there working in a medium that I love, like working with aerosol if it's – if it's something that I have to tone down, I'll do it. it. And then that then that allows me to then go and paint a guy with a teacup for a head or a <laughs> teapot for a head in my own time and get all those extra creative creative ideas out there. It's just part of being a keen bean as well. Yeah, like yeah. if someone's like, Can you do this? You're like, Yep. Yeah, I'll give it sure, a go. Sure. Like yeah. you can pay for it. What do you sure, want? I'll yeah. learn on the job. Like, That's let's it. go. That's exactly it. <laughs> I think if if you're starting out and saying no, I'm not going to paint this because I don't. I want to work. Do, I want to do this thing, and you want me to do that. Then you've either got to be super confident and back yourself the whole way, or you're going to find yourself getting kind of rejected a little bit. Mm. And they're saying, actually, we're going to go in a different direction. Have you ever had a commission job that you've just fucked up? Like, I mean, probably. I, I have no doubt that I have, but I've just either like, okay, I'm done. I'll let, let's move on. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I mean, now now you've got me thinking. We'll come back. I mean, I know I fuck up most of the artworks that I <laughs> no. do. But, but, but like but then royally, it's you know, you royally. know. <laughs> I think, I mean, with Penny University, this is these are the paste-ups um, in the, the cafe and when they were initially speaking to me, I was like, I can do these paste ups and they were really like enamored with that idea. But I guess it wasn't a fuck up initially, but that slow decay of the work over time, um, which I mean, I hadn't expected them to stay up for, it's like seven, eight years yeah. now. and That's part of the character. I, I mean, <laughs> it is, but maybe that's just me not, showing foresight and going, well, here's how you can further protect them. I, I mean, I put layers of um, wheat, paste, wheat paste over the top to give them further protection but not really considering the logistics of people rubbing up them, mm -hmm. uh, rubbing up against them every single day. So not necessarily fuck up in the art side but more the application of it. Yeah. But, I, I mean, they loved it. I think they still love it. I, I'm ho I hope they do. Yeah. Visit Canberra loves it. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm still happy with the work. So that's what matters, right? Yeah. But that's ultimately it's whether we're happy. Portfolio piece. Sure. Do you 
<laughs> do you consider yourself an artist? <laughs> is that the A word? Like a part-time artist. I'd I'd consider myself a part-time artist. Yeah. Even though I'm producing and like or creating in every spare moment that I have. Because I don't. Yeah, that is a. I say do designer. You, you say yeah. designer. I, I say artist, but I also don't like to introduce myself. Hi, I'm James. I'm an artist. <laughs> I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an artist. And I feel I feel like it's almost like like an artist is like perfect something or is really good at something, and I feel like I'm just like pretty average at lots of things, but keen to get into things. That's like it. it's the, the it's a hobby. It's attitude. a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a go. Yeah, but I feel like an artist has to do like that's your ten thousand hours. You're in it, like to be like it's an artistry, you know. Yeah. But that's also probably a bit. But you're both black professional white. artists because you're getting paid to do art. Yeah, that's so the interesting. I would thing. I would say that you don't have to be, even though your both your work is perfection in my eyes. Uh, I don't think you Stop have to be. Have, I don't think you have to be perfect to be an artist or to call yourself an artist. But the professional thing just comes in and then you're getting paid. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But I don't like to refer to myself as an artist, even though I make videos. Yeah. But I don't think of them as art in that way, more as a functional thing that does a job. But if I'm putting in a grant, I'm an artist for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that label, like <laughs> finding the right context for yeah, yes, yeah. I am an artist. Yeah, yeah. I was recently knocked back because they were like, oh, you're actually not a, a an emerging artist. I'm like, what do you mean I'm not an emerging Oh, sh- shit, I've been doing this a while now. <laughs> but like if you look through this, uh, the, the CV that you've sent, you can see that you're actually quite... You're overqualified. Over, I mean, I was yeah. and it was the first time I was like, oh, I have been doing this a while and it's no longer just a, a little thing I do on the side. It, yeah, yeah, maybe I am an artist. Maybe you have done your 10,000 hours. <laughs> Oh, definitely. Definitely, surely, yeah, I reckon. Surely. Just on that water tank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've still, you still got to come out and paint that tank. Yeah. We arranged it ages ago. And I don't keep raining. Through. Yeah. <laughs> the collab. How did you guys get in, get together in working together? It was just through events. I don't think we've ever actually, like, worked collaboratively together. I think we've just always worked alongside to each other. We had that one piece... Um, I still have it somewhere where it was on a Lazy Susan from oh, yeah. um, from Ikea and I painted hands holding different, like I think there was a sheath of wheat and an apple and it was like connecting to And I um, would have just decorated around you, it. You filled the space around yeah. it because it was when you were doing like focusing on the mandalas and I don't know, I was focusing on mythology and it was some connection to the four cardinal a compass points. I don't know. I've got it somewhere, maybe, hopefully. Sick. But I think that's the only time, yeah, that we've actually created together. Yeah, but we've been at constantly events together, like painting next door to each other on separate teams of things maybe. I don't know. But I have to say that, like, you've always been such – a nice, welcoming, helpful person. And, like, for someone to, like, just start out in, the, in you know, I would have been young and dumb, 21, I don't know, like, not knowing anything and you would, thank you. Thank you for always being so nice. I, I wouldn't still be in the industry today <laughs> if it weren't. But, I mean, you've got to, there's no need to come out and be a dick, like, as no. an artist. And especially when you're trying to. I mean, it's why why I like working with you because you are just so keen to, to get involved in things and then that makes me feel better about getting involved in things as well. I get. Do we kiss now? Like, <laughs> that, that picture that you had up as the main image. Oh, yeah. Um, that was at... A I was wondering what that was. Collab from, yeah. Meets Science. That was for National Science Week yeah, run yeah. by Lee Constable. So we were partnered with um, a researcher and we put up art. And that image that you've got is uh, James rolling up a tiny little piece of paper and stuffing it into the head of the, um, the cap, the yeah, cap yeah. of the spray can because I am really trash with a spray can and I couldn't do my tag. 
because <laughs> it was too fat. And yeah. you're like, oh, here's this trick. It'll make it way skinnier. <laughs> I mean, if it helps, Abyss taught me that. <laughs> it was like, hold on. He pulled out like a bus ticket and ripped it up and folded it up and, and put it in there. I'm just passing it on. I know, it's great. Yeah. But constantly giving tips. It's great. Yeah, that, we, that's why we stick around. That's why I stick around you because I'm learning. I'm, I'm, I feel that like that, the whole, I mean, everything you did with um, Surfaced, it, I'm trying to learn from from that from you, that arranging and kind of projecting these incredible ideas and getting other people to buy in and go, yeah, that's actually really cool. We can do that. Yeah, buy-in's a fun concept. I love it. That's good. Just a concept? Oh, Getting it actually happening too. But Even like, better. you know, like you have an idea and getting everyone on the same page of that idea and just as exciting as you are. Like that's What do you magic. mean by buying? So like when uh, arranging anything, if I like arranging a festival, getting you involved and making it the best possible outcome for you and getting like, this is the brand rebellion in me, the getting like the values aligned and getting everyone like keen for the same outcome and just getting the keenness all together. Mm. And if you bring people along for like the full journey, then the final day of it is like awesome for everyone. Yeah. I think you definitely facilitate that keenness in other artists. It's it's definitely one of the reasons why there is that core pocket of artists in Canberra and even those that may have moved out uh, or moved on to different things like JRB doing tattoos and Swerf going to be a movie like Melbourne doing their own thing there and Smalls up in Queensland. All these artists, I think there was this moment where we were all there and you were just this, yeah, let's, that kind of enthusiasm there, I think definitely kept people working together. <laughs> Hang on to it. Bottle yeah, it. Let's yeah, go. <laughs> yeah. It's strange though thinking of all the artists that have kind of just dissipated moving on doing their own thing elsewhere yeah it's fun but, and and yeah i mean it's awesome for them but i think it sucks for canberra it was great for canberra while they were here it was like a golden golden era in God, a way. it makes you feel old when you talk about it like that hey yeah like but it, it like it's was. not like, even that long ago it's though Mm. When all those, like you mentioned, Abyss, you both done works with him, yeah, um, and that there was just so much going on, which you mentioned before, like art not a part and that, but maybe it slowed down. I don't know, or maybe we don't know, but I don't think so. I, I think it has slowed down. But I, I also think that me like calling it the golden age also doesn't do justice to the artists that are still making stuff now. I mean, Raw, a lot Lawrence, he's just powering through through works, and like other art, I think Fungi, I I haven't painted with them, but I'm seeing like awesome stuff coming out. Um, there's Murray, like another another writer that um that again working with Lawrence. Lawrence seems to be this new little gravitational force pulling artists into him, which is which is awesome. Yeah, it's sick. Yeah, and then he's got his own thing running off and. Like the the dancing and teaching that, it's cool. Unreal. And how do you find all this time to do this while also being a an English teacher? I mean, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, late late at night. It's sunsets on the tank. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Today is the my early day at, at, at school so I get to come home and I get two hours in which I'm just going to try and now use this to, to paint more consistently. But it, it ebbs and flows too. Like yeah. when you – it's like, you know, the muscle you exercise as you get the ball rolling, you get really inspired but then like winter hits and fuck, it's hard to get up <laughs> and do yep. stuff. Yeah. I've gotten – I mean I've gotten back into stickers recently because I can't go out outside to paint. Yeah. And – it's easy to sit in front of the fireplace with a like a roll of sticker paper and just smash them out. Yeah, it, it's just grabbing those moments. I mean, when are you doing your collages? You that goes in like full chaos mode of a hundred miles an hour, and then it stops for weeks. Yeah, yeah. So it's just yeah, big ebbs and flows. 
I, th- I think the only consistent thing with me are the other books, the the little mini illustrations, because I want to keep reading, um, but I also, as I said, won't start the next book until I've done that illustration. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I'm four or five books that I haven't posted up now simply because it's, I don't know, posting on Instagram is a pain in the ass. <laughs> that maintaining a digital presence is job in itself absolutely uh, yeah and just like the expectations of you have to be constantly producing for it i mean i can rant and rave but i won't i know but you're constantly thinking about this group of people who are judging you about it but who are those people like you've made them up <laughs> <laughs> and you're not monetizing the algorithm so like I mean, I think that's something that some artists do very well, being able to like, yeah, yeah. monetize their, their their platforms. But I I keep it just more as a record of my art. Yeah, that's great. I mean, those collages never going to see the light of day? No. Just, just for you? <laughs> so the, the, they're a mix of um, like National Geographic, um, these old – 80s UFO magazines called Explained. Yes. Um, and the Playboys I bought at the Lifeline bookshop. Incredible. <laughs> okay. So they're uh, not only like have very outdated um, like conspiracy content, but also just like uh, nudies. Like <laughs> n- nudies. That's like that's not going on Instagram. But I think part of making them was like making stuff that I know no one's ever going to see. So therefore I'm like judging my own biases with it. Uh, even to the point of like cutting up a, cutting up a naked person, like made me feel weird. And then I was like, okay, why? And what is this? And all that sort of stuff. I don't know. And especially with National Geographic magazines is there's so many, there's so many cultural things throughout them that, and so many like historical things that then cutting them up and sticking them next to things that are very juxtaposing. Yeah, okay. I don't want to make any statements and I'm not making any statements. It's just chaos and colour. Mostly it's colour. <laughs> it's like colour theory. Do you like, theory. like, do you often play with different mediums? Like what's drawn you to collage in particular? I think it's the glossy magazines. Yeah, okay. I think it's just shiny like, things. Yeah. All right. And like, I th- it's just the perfectionism of it all. Also the, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but it's not just magazines. I have been cutting up books from the Lifeline Book Fair and that feels illegal. <laughs> you get, I mean, you get over it. I don't know. Cutting into a hardcover. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It, because I, I used to make um, like secret uh, spaces in books and so you'd glue all the pages oh, yeah. down then you'd cut through it. I mean, you're not going out and purposely picking the classics or are you just grabbing whatever book you can find that, that works? I mean, most of them are cool just like, I just love the conspiracy table at the Lifeline Book Fair. It's all like UFO books yeah, and yeah. witches and stuff like that. So it's like anything with cool imagery, a reference okay. imagery and stuff like that. I love. I've got one that I'll lend you under the, you know, prerequisite that you don't cut it. I was up. about don't do it. But, I'll cut it up. <laughs> but it's like, is Elvis is alive, and it comes with a tape cassette, oh, that's and sick. it's all, yeah, it, it's wild. It's good, but I think I found it in like a similar place. So I sit like Lifeline Book Fair. I'm like, what is this? Yeah. Oh, I need this. This is for me. But even on the weekend, uh, I went. I went on holiday on the weekend, and I took a blank journal because I was like. I'm going to be creative. I'm going to journal and do that like stream of conscious or whatever. Um, and I found that like, as I was writing it, I was still like editing in my head and curating in my head and making it sound nice and stuff like that. And that like, I wouldn't write on the page if I, if it wasn't like a good sentence and that sort of stuff, like it's just, this like perfectionism. I don't know. And at a point I just wrote pee pee poo poo. Cause I had to like get out of that. And then I was like, well, the journal's ruined now. <laughs> I didn't that's write anything bin. else. That's in the bin. Yeah, I was okay. like, what does this say about me? I, I understand that completely. When like when I was first starting and the little um, like sketchbooks, 
I had to finish that sketch. It wasn't half done yeah. and then I'd move to the next. And then I think I was like, no, I've got to break out of this in exactly the same way. I just did like real shitty half-finished sketches and then I never sketched mm. again. Like, yeah, it, that perfectionism is difficult. Art of unlearning. Difficult. How yeah. do you unlearn things? Head injuries. <laughs> just lots of concussions. Yeah. We'll, we'll try and avoid those as much as we can there, but... Yeah, fair enough. Um, you, we've been speaking nearly an hour. Wrap up soon, but one more thing. You you mentioned conspiracies <laughs> there, and I wanted to ask you about what I think, until recently, might be the most secretive mural <gasps> in Australia. Is it in Canberra? Yeah, it's in Canberra. I I don't even know if you can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, and I think you can talk about it because I recently saw it appear somewhere. Yeah. And I spoke to these people. Um, but, yeah, what can you tell us about this this secret wall? I, I did a mural for a government agency. Um, I don't know how much I can say. Was it ASIO? <laughs> It, it was. It was an ASIO. Um, I, 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 you can say because I'll, I'll show you this. It, it was on the. Um, yeah, there was a, a an ABC um, docu documentary yeah. recently, and that yeah, that's what it came up. Yeah. In. <laughs> I'm so intrigued. It is underground in Canberra, thirteen thousand kilometres away. Synchronising very, very carefully so our cyber effects with a commander in the field who was moving <laughs> troops around uh, in order to give that commander uh, the advantage that, that they needed. Military commanders in Iraq. Not what you'd expect in the background. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's the simplest of ASD's payloads. So, I've got a mural in the bottom of ASD's building in Russell and. The bunker? Yeah, in the, uh, in, it's in the basement. Um, and it was, it was awesome. It was real weird, um, but really cool. So somebody, um, reached out and said, would like you to, to paint a mural down here. Like he was a guy that was working in that space and from like sheer luck managed to get permission from the higher ups to allow this to happen. Um, going in, I like no phone, nothing like normally I, I listen to music or, um, but they were like, you can't take anything like that in. Somebody had to sit there and watch me paint the entire time. Um, and they brought up music that people had brought in in the past and like CDs that were then like ripped onto the computers and then the CDs were broken because they can't go back <laughs> out. Um, and they just had this weird eclectic mix of music that people had been like building over over years. And I just painted these. They're like, would like, it was very weird. They're like, we want this and this and this. And I'm like, okay, cool. And... A dog so, on a hand? Dog on a hand. There's a pterodactyl. There's a, a wasp. A, um, there's a, a Viking with uh, a glass of scotch or, or whiskey um, because there was a Viking whiskey there, like a, 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 a whiskey Viking, which is just a guy with a big beard that liked his whiskey. What, well, that and worked there? That worked there. Uh, I, I, th I think. I think that was mix. it. But. You just imagine that brainstorm of the staff yeah, just being like, like oh, yeah, check this, this, this up. Yeah, yeah. A pterodactyl would be sick. Yeah. And, and then throughout the entire back of it, I've got binary in there that I think, it, I think, I mean, this is a while ago now, and it says whole loves you in binary. Um, and I've like pushed that throughout. The the, yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got, they, I, I couldn't take photos of this thing either, um, which is like you finish a mural, you take a photo, you document it, and I couldn't take any photos of it. Um, but then I was given like maybe a year later, they'd had like a fish, an official photographer co come in and same sort of lockdown as, as I had. They took this photo and so I've got this strip. It's about this long. Panorama. Um, yeah, and it like wraps both sides of it. And yeah, real little so secret, cool. secret mural. So cool. And the, thing, the, the other thing with it is that even the people working there will probably never find out because the lights are on permanently. But there's a, there's a Where's Wally at one point like leaning out from behind a door and his eyes, I got uh, glow-in-the-dark paint from Sancho's and his eyes glow. 
but the lights are on there permanently so that it'll never... So one day down. when the power goes out, it'll be <laughs> blasting. <laughs> Years of light. <laughs> Just projecting out like the wall opposite will catch fire. Yeah. That's going to be the security downfall next year. But, yeah, seeing it up there, I, I had no idea it was coming out. So I was like, is this your art chain? So I'm like, yes. Yeah, unmistakably <laughs> your art. Yeah, so I was like, oh, that is awesome. And I wonder if that photo can be, can you give that, release that? Cause it's, I think so. I mean, it's, it's something up, up until this docker, no one else would have seen unless you have the t- top level security clearance in Australia. Like no one else can see that. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of cool. That's pretty I've, special. Yeah. I, I know where the photos are. I'll, I'll maybe later tonight. I'll, yeah. I'll yeah. Scroll through. <laughs> them. It, was, it, was, it was a fun mural as well. Did you have to get a security clearance or did, did no. they just say if you don't have anything on you? There's not much you can do. So I think that's why there was somebody sitting there watching me that I wasn't going snooping through desks and and looking around. They'd cleared it all out as well. Like they, I had to book in a particular time so that any documents weren't just sitting out in the open and they watched me just. (laughs) What a job. Yeah. Literally watching paint dry. Yeah. Yeah. Unreal. Well. Anything else you guys want to touch on? Um, what's coming up next? Um, we've got the collages, got more water tank murals. I think I think if anyone, uh, any business owners out there that are looking to turn their space into a gallery space, I want to see the the collages. Mm. I want I want them out there, Brit. The collages need to be seen. <laughs> I might get cancelled. Maybe <laughs> create a new name. They're not associated with you anymore. <laughs> It's yeah. just you've got to come up with a new tag and that will be this separate identity. Yeah, Canberra will just have some real wild paste yeah. ups in the next couple of months. <laughs> It'll be a mystery. Yeah. So good guys, can't wait to see it all. Thank you again for popping into the flats and thank you everyone watching at home. Thanks for having uh, us. Yeah, stay thank tuned you. and uh yeah, we'll be following uh to see what's next. Gotcha. Thank you.